Thanks very much, Peter, and good evening, everybody. The uh, picture on your screen is uh, represents this place where Fish Passage really first grabbed me, and uh, I have been committed to the topic of Fish Passage and Fishways uh, ever since, pretty much. I took the shot in uh, a week before Christmas in 1978, and it's a nice little stream in the south coast uh, called Currambeen Creek, just a couple of hundred metres upstream of its confluence with the Clyde River estuary. But it was a very important place for me, um, as I found during my one-day visit there. I was on a, a survey of the habitats of bass up and down the east coast of Australia, and um, stopped at a number of sites like this to look at bass populations and things that were happening. So my routine was to set some uh, sampling equipment to catch uh, adult and sub-adult bass upstream of this site and to leave that set overnight and then to have a look around. And uh, this causeway was particularly interesting um, because it was just upstream of the estuary and when I went hunting about I found that in the middle channel um, on the far side, on the downstream side of the causeway, was the main concentration of flow. And lo and behold, there were large numbers of riddle fish, about 30 millimetres long, all banked up underneath that last bit of white water, um, which was pretty interesting. They uh, turned out to be Australian bass juveniles, recently hatched juveniles. And in the morning when I lifted the sampling gear upstream, expecting to find anything from 10 to 20 Australian bass, typically in a nice site like that, there was only one. And the penny began to drop there and then, that there was something going on that was a bit significant. There was all these juvenile bass attempting to get upstream and unable to make it over this 40 millimetre, uh, 40 centimetre or so drop at the causeway, and the population of adult bass upstream seemed to be grossly impoverished. And that's led me into fish migration topics. So migration ecology, uh, I'd, I'd like to just firstly run through um, a brief outline of what I want to talk about in my half hour. Firstly, talk about migration ecology and why it is that fish move. Look at some examples uh, around the country. Um, again, take notice of some of the migration barriers that we've put in their way. Um, and think about the solutions to the problems that that creates. Finally, to narrow down a bit to the topic of fish waste performance and uh, their effectiveness in rehabilitating fish communities. And finally, to uh, do a bit of a plug for a project that we're running at the University of New South Wales to develop an innovative and uh, very different kind of fish waste system. I think everybody understands that some fish migrate in rivers with the dramatic visual uh, evidence that you see with things like Atlantic salmon leaping up tall waterfalls like this one in Ireland. Um, fabulous um, example of a powerful migration going on with phenomenal swimming capacity and energy being applied by those kinds of species, the salmons and trouts, to migrate within their system. But here in Australia, we've got a number of pretty special examples of our own. The left-hand picture is a school of migrating striped mullet, um, migrating out of the rivers, down into the estuary, and out to sea to spawn. And um, tons of fish in a school like that. A very different representation of another kind of adaptation on the right-hand screen, where uh, these pretty little spangled perch of the inland and northern Australia are in fact migrating busily. There's five of them in that picture at various stages, and they're migrating busily up an inundated bit of roadway. It's been a cloudburst. The two water bodies have been connected. There's an overland flow along this road, and these really aggressive little migrants are seeking to re-establish themselves upstream by travelling along in just a couple of centimetres of water over quite substantial distances. So they're pretty tough. A different kind of adaptation again, the picture on the top right hand side, um, both those two were taken at Penrith Weir and um, they're of a little fish species about as big as my little finger called a coxus gudgeon and they're one of the several species that have enormous climbing ability. So they're going straight up this wetted surface at Penrith Weir in their hundreds. Those are 
uh, hundreds of uh, little coxicogens on the left hand picture and an individual one on the right. On the left hand bottom picture there's a very different scale of uh, climbing ability. Ellenborough Falls near my home in the Manning uh, catchment or the neighbouring catchment. Um, Ellenborough Falls has about 200 millimetres, uh, 200 metres vertical drop. It was brought to my attention when a bunch of trout fishermen were attempting to establish a trout fishery upstream of the falls and built themselves a fish hatchery and started releasing trout and then came up with a series of complaints that they weren't doing any good because the eels in the stream were eating all their little fish. And that really grabbed me because I knew from the life cycle of eels, which most people might be aware of, that every one of those eels has climbed up that 200 metre fall to colonise upstream. Uh, unbelievable as that might seem when you look at it. And you have a third different kind of adaptation that's pretty well represented in Australia it seems is on the bottom right. The picture is of juvenile Australian bass again. These ones are about 50 millimetres long, but uh, they're just a, a picture of the species. The ones that I'm interested in that migrate using the estuarine uh, tidal gravity circulation are only 12, 15, 20 millimetres long and have extraordinarily little swimming ability. As you can imagine with fish this big, they can hardly swim any distance at all. And yet their spawning zone is well down in the Hawkesbury estuary on this occasion and they appear weeks later many tens of kilometres upstream that they couldn't possibly have, have swum by themselves. And uh, in my ignorance at the time I had to learn the hard way that there's this thing called tidal gravity circulation where the surface water, predominantly fresh water, is flowing backward and forward with the tide. But down on the bottom, the, the tidal uh, gravity circulation is driving almost continual flow upstream and when I finally got around to using sampling gear that would sample small fish on the bottom of the estuary I found there was a stream of them going upstream by that method and making extraordinary distances in doing so. So there are some special adaptations to migratory fish for migratory fish in this country. The questions often posed, how many are there? And uh, I get the feeling that the further we go with observing fish migrations and working on the, on the problems of this topic, uh, that certainly most and probably all freshwater species migrate to some degree, to varying, enormously varying spatial um, scales. There's two groups that can be identified of, of uh, migratory species in the country that and, and worldwide for that matter, is diadromous species that migrate between freshwater and saltwater environments in their life cycle. And there are potamodromous fish that just migrate within the rivers themselves and don't go into salt. A few examples on the right hand side there, the top species is one of the diadromous fishes that are called anadromous, that actually spend most of their life in saltwater and then move into freshwater to breed and then go back to saltwater. The second one is the reverse of that, uh, the Australian bass was one, but this one is the barramundi, the mighty barramundi from the north, and it's uh, one of a large number of species, perhaps more than anywhere else in the world that we have in eastern Australia, that are actually cat animals, and breed in salt water and move up into fresh water. And the third subgroup in that diadromous bunch are the amphidromous ones, which migrate between freshwater and salt water, but not for breeding, so for different uh, life history purposes. And the bottom one, of course, the potamodromus fish is just a representative of a large number of uh, freshwater fish that migrate ex entirely within rivers, and it's the mighty Murray cod. So why would fish populations evolve this strong tendency for migration? and why is it important and what's in it for them? I think the answers come about uh, through the general topic of population dynamics and population viability and that's where it becomes important for us. Um, population dynamics processes in fish lives are important at those three dot point levels that uh, you can identify. 
Firstly, it's important for the purposes of reproduction and recruitment for populations, and that occurs in the early stages because the places that are specialised, that fish are specialised on for spawning and for nursery habitats are often a bit separate. And spawned, uh, newly hatched fish have to move into nursery habitats to grow and to, to become large enough to migrate further into the second class of habitats, which are growth habitats, which are commonly far distant and um, often hundreds of kilometres and sometimes perhaps thousands of kilometres. Um, the, the picture of the fish is a pretty little fish, uh, endangered species, 20 up to maybe 30 centimetres long or so, the Australian grayling, highly endangered, lives down around the south coast of the country, southeast coast, and um, it's an example because it spawns in fresh water, its larvae are washed into the ocean where they undergo a nursery phase, and then, having grown a bit, they move back into fresh water to colonise it. The third group of justifications for uh, migratory adaptations is the question of survival. Population survival is enhanced when uh, there are dispersal migrations, where the populations disperse into broad areas of their habitat so that they're not all concentrated in one particular zone that might be uh, devastated by floods or droughts and actually wipe out a population if it was too concentrated. So when you get those local <coughs> extirpations, you can, um, you know, dispersed population, you can get subpopulations from other areas coming in to make up and recover the system. So there's those three broad kinds of advantages in migration for fish, but there are also costs, of course, the way up against it. There are the costs of moving that include energetics. It takes a lot of energy and food supplies and so on to jump up waterfalls or swim powerfully for hundreds of kilometres. There are also mortality risks of predation, starvation and disease in populations that get excessively concentrated. But the fact that so many fish have evolved migra migratory behaviour to me means that the costs of moving are less than the benefits of doing so. <coughs> Turning to the barriers that we put in the way of, uh, of those migrations, Thank you. <coughs> there's natural ones of course, like waterfalls, rapids, cascades and so on, and then there's all the artificial ones such as hydraulic barriers, dams and weirs and uh, that class of thing, uh, <coughs> and there are also barriers created for transport, road crossings, railway crossings, what have you. And uh, another form of artificial barrier that we don't often recognise quite so readily <coughs> is water extraction. When um, water extraction schemes are put in place, sometimes they create zones of very high water velocity in, in streams, in, uh, at least in localised areas. <coughs> and that can create a barrier for fish that can't cope with high velocities. But more commonly, Water extraction leads to reduction in, in stream depth, and particularly over critical uh, natural barriers like riffle zones. So water extraction can quite frequently be a, a significant physical barrier, and it's being increasingly recognised in the development of environmental flow regimes. As well as those physical ones, there's also physiological barriers. And uh, one that's uh, been prominent in my experience has been the problem of cold water pollution, where um, hypoluminetic, hypoluminetic water is released from the base of stratified large dams, particularly in the inland storages. And uh, like uh, Barrandong Dam in the picture here, <coughs> can release water um, at 10 to 12 degrees in summer, that is below the ambient temperature that the fish are adapted to, and that cold water shock can extend for uh, at least 300 kilometres in that particular system. So that's a profound physiological impact on the growth, survival, and certainly migration of, of the fish that are there. And there's other similar kinds of pollution or related pollution such as acid sulphate soil drainage in a lot of coastal systems, 
and various other toxicants, and one natural one where migrating fish have to cross the barrier between salt water and fresh water and make a, a physiological adaptation to the different osmotic, uh, osmotic conditions that they confront when they do that. So lots of migration barriers in their way. I'm sure this audience is pretty well aware that the scope of this problem uh, around the world and in Australia is, is pretty huge. There have been a couple of uh, papers recently totting up the numbers of dams uh, around the world and, and they uh, have concluded there's something like 50,000 dams worldwide that are over 15 metres high. Um, in Australia, Ann Cole tells us that there's something like 500 dams in this country that are over 10 metres high. So we've got a pretty substantial population of both those uh, forms of high structures, but as well there are a, a diverse range of other kinds of barriers. The um, causeways, um, the block banks, the, the floodgates and what have you. The Murray-Darling Basin Commission some years ago did an estimate of the numbers of those in the Murray-Darling Basin and came up with this figure of something like 10,000. And Matthew Gordos is, um, is here, is um, working on that um, kind of enumeration in New South Wales where there has in the past been a number of, a similar number of 10,000 generated which is open to discussion. So what are the effects of all these migration barriers? Broadly population declines is the most obvious answer. 74% um, 70, 70, I think is the figure um, of, the, of uh, worldwide freshwater fish declines in the last 40, 40 years. 74% um, documented worldwide. Uh, in the Murray-Darling Basin, again, another estimate from the MDBC was that there'd been a 90% decline in freshwater fish through the period of human, uh, sorry, of European habitation in the country. Um, there's something like between 30 and 50 endangered or threatened freshwater fish being identified and threatened species lists at Commonwealth and state levels throughout the country. Those things automatically mean that aquatic biodiversity has been substantially decreased and it's in gross decline in many places. Um, along with that goes water quality changes. And one example perhaps uh, is relevant that when you take away populations of native predatory fish above dams, um, if, if you uh, reduce the predation pressure on test species like carp when they come in, then you can have a bloom of those pest populations and they in turn can produce the well-known water quality problems that carp generate. And there are other examples <coughs> of similar sorts. And uh, naturally if there are commercial or recreational fisheries that are important in areas where fish population declines are going on, then those values go out the window. So you can identify, identify a whole bunch of ecological and cultural and hydrological impacts of uh, impoundments in our rivers. There are, thank goodness, some solutions to the issues and uh, they're being actively pursued. First and foremost, we can avoid the problem. And a key example of that is the creation of off-stream storages uh, for water supply. We have one just adjacent to where I live where the Manning River is pumped in high flows into a, a dam or into a, a storage behind a dam wall in a dry gully and that avoids putting a barrier in the river. You can remove barriers that are no longer justified and there is a program underway in New South Wales Fisheries picture on the top right is a clip from that, where barriers like road crossings and so on are either being modified or where necessary removed, and that extends to weirs as well. And in the US there's a quite a well advanced program of large scale dam removal. Um, as well as avoiding the problem or removing the barrier, you can build a fishway of course, which is where we started out. Martin might correct me, but uh, as far as I know, the first fishway built in the country was at Penrith Weir in about 1927, and uh, 
in fact, it was the first of four fishways that had been built on that structure with varying degrees of success. That particular simple design was created with very little understanding of the necessary technology, obviously, just a simple ramp. But I spoke years ago to an old fisherman who was a regular attendant at that site and uh, fishing there, and he tells me that in, in high flows he's seen Australian bass get up on their sides and flap up that, that barrier. So they're pretty determined, and some certainly got over it, but you'd hardly class it as an effective fishway. In the bottom right is a picture of the much more uh, effective, quite highly effective uh, fishway on Turumbury Weir in the middle Murray, which has adopted the vertical slot uh, design that I'm sure the other speakers will, will go into in some detail. And it's, and it's performing uh, quite well. <coughs> so in mitigating fish passage problems, we've made a lot of progress over the last 30 or so years, and it began with New South Wales uh, and the investments that they've made, which uh, that started in 1982 with a commission to an American specialist by the name of George Iker, who was brought out to consult and to advise on uh, a research plan, uh, identification of problems, designing a fish passage program. And it's gone on from there with a continued investment and uh, with collaboration with the various water agencies who own the, the structures and, uh, and manage the water flows. Um, <coughs> Fishways performance has been have debated uh, fairly considerably because there have been substantial problems in the past. The early designs that we imported following George Iker's visit and before that uh, were, were pretty poor in terms of their performance. Um, ideal performance standards um, were first discussed, as far as I'm aware in this country, when Martin Allen Cooper and I sat down back in the early 80s, in the late 80s rather, if I remember, and we at that stage uh, agreed that an ideal standard would be that 95% of all the fish individuals arriving at a barrier with a fishway on it would be able to ascend that barrier and get over it um, within some 95% of the overall flow uh, range of that site. And as well as that, 100% of all the species attempting to migrate over the site would be able to get over as well. That's pretty challenging when uh, you understand the um, range of diversity in the Australian fish biota, ranging from metre plus Murray cod another powerful swimming large fish down to 10 or 12 millimetre, 12 or 15 millimetre juvenile fish that also show migratory behaviour in some rivers. Uh, so powerful swimmers, great big fish, tiny little fish, really weak swimmers, the whole lot that we set out to be able to cope with and uh, with varying degrees of success. That has been boosted by the recognition that engineers and biologists have to co collaborate to make this stuff work. If either a, a, an engineer or a biologist alone attempts to create a fishway, in my experience, it's either going to fall down or not function. Um, so that, that uh, collaboration between the two disciplines is essential. In terms of fishways performance, um, I believe that high-level fishways are, have been a special problem. Their uh, performance is a long way behind where we were all uh, hoping to get with ideal performance levels. And fishway costs have been a major disincentive because they're much too high. Um, the fact that performance has not always been great and the costs are particularly high um, is leading to a lot of pressure to improve on those two things. The picture at the right is, if you don't know, is the new, uh, the latest fishway built on a high structure in New South Wales on the Shoalhaven River at Tallawa Dam. It cost $48 million, uh, some 10 or so years ago now, I guess, and its performance has been uh, moderate. Um, fish have been trapped at the base of the fishway, which uh, involves 
a trapping device leading into a, a, a trolley arrangement and uh, then the trolley is elevated and fish are carried to the top of the crest and then delivered over into the storage. So fish were in one experiment captured and tagged at the bottom and then checked as uh, the trolley went over the top but only 40% of those fish attempting to move actually made it. And unfortunately, Tallarua has been, um, like virtually all of the other high fishways in the country, it's been operating for something like half the time only. Um, there's been a long series of mechanical, structural, and particularly electronic failures that have severely interrupted their performance. So we have to do that. And that's led us into the program at New South Wales uh, University to uh, work on a novel design. Um, Mr. Colleagues there in, in an interdisciplinary um, system uh, to work on a, a novel fishway called the, the pump fishway. Um, <coughs> this is a picture of a fairly rustic scale model of a pump fish, fishway being tested in a fish hatchery on Australian bass juveniles. And um, I'll uh, just lay out a broad outline of the operation of it. But to start with, um, here's a commercial fish pump showing one of the pr principles of what we're looking at. We're trying to combine what's known about fish passage, the techniques and um, requirements of effective fishways to combine that with the techniques that are used in aquaculture and fish farms to actually move fish around in pumps with, uh, with safety and uh, efficiency. So this is a, a fish farm in Tasmania growing great big Atlantic salmon. And in the shot, the pipe at the bottom right is leading from a, a pen of salmon and through the uh, black pump, the black pipe descending down into the water, which has an airlift pump at the bottom of it. And that's pulling fish through, raising them up a couple of metres, gravitating them through a grader, their size grader, which is splitting them into two groups and uh, delivering them safely to the far side. And the point was that uh, they moved 10,000 of these great big fish um, between two and four kilos through a 200 mil pipe in three hours and none of them were damaged. So it was a pretty impressive indication that this is a great way to safely move fish around and it's one of the techniques we're trying to meld into this novel development of the pump fishway. So we're combining four technologies. Firstly, the known stuff about fish passage as best we can. Um, then what's known about aquaculture transfer, transfer methods, um, combining also hydroelectric energy techniques and a novel system of hydraulic pumping that uh, Professor Bill Pearson from Water Research Laboratory has developed and uh, has uh, recently published on and um, verified with physical modeling and, and, uh, and arithmetic modeling. And it's been shown to be capable of lifting fish uh, over a height of more than 100 meters. And to do that without pressure changes on the fish, uh, experienced by the fish, which is a, a threat to them. We think that this is shaping up to become a compact, lightweight, and modular, uh, uh, compact structure that's capable of modular construction, and uh, therefore could be floating, which would give it a potential advantage in making it independent of tailwater variation, one of the big bugbears of the fishways in this country. It could be barge mounted and repositioned as necessary, and uh, also has the potential um, benefits of being constantly in operation, short cycling period, energy independent because it would generate its own energy. And we have now got to the stage with those model experiments of ex establishing proof of concept experimentally. And the publication of that is underway at the moment. So just to finish, a list of the benefits uh, we see in the pump fishway concept. Um, firstly, primarily, it should be much less limited than other fishways have been by the constraints of fish physiology and behaviour and size. Um, it should be highly versatile. 
adaptable either to new sites or to retrofitting and to sites that are more than perhaps two metres high. Um, because it can be um, <coughs> built in pieces and stuck together for an appropriate site and uh, it should be very low in terms of capital costs and because it's very simple with only a couple of moving parts it should be um, have very low operating costs as well and be reliable for once. It should be energy dependent, independent rather so that uh, it could be located in the far inland at sites that are rarely serviced and don't have any energy and we think that it's possible for us to incorporate all of the four key fishway functions that are essential. Um, attraction of fish to find the site of the fishway itself in a river, which has been one of the great problems. Uh, then getting fish to actually go into it, which uh, has been another big problem. And then passage through it, uh, getting them to go right through the system. And finally, uh, allowing them to find refuge when they get over the top and into the storage is also part of the, of the essential uh, set of requirements for an effective fishway. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for listening.